Welcome everyone. Hi, my name is Melanie Kress and I am the Associate Curator for Highline Art, the public art program presented by the Highline in New York City. I want to welcome you all and thank you for joining us for our second conversation in the six part speaker series, The Normalizing Gaze, Surveillance from Drones to Phones. This event is titled Artificial Intelligence and Algorithms, How We Train Surveillance Tools. This series is organized in conjunction with artist Sam Durant's Highline Plant Commission Untitled Drone, which opened this spring and will be on view on the Highline at 30th Street through August of 2022. Untitled Drone is a large scale fiberglass sculpture in the shape of an abstracted predator drone sitting atop a 25 foot steel pole. This work continues Highline Art's mission of presenting new, powerful, thought provoking artworks that generate and amplify today's most important conversations. Inspired by this artwork, the Speaker Series brings together artists, activists, scholars, filmmakers, journalists, and more to demystify the twinned histories of surveillance and drone warfare and illuminate routine examples of surveillance in our daily lives. The Normalizing Gaze for Surveillance from Drone to Phones is presented by the Highline and the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, a nonprofit advocacy organization and legal services provider that litigates and advocates for privacy. We're thrilled to have STOPS Executive Director Albert Fox Khan here to be moderating today's conversation. As we begin, I have a few announcements regarding the logistics of the event. These will also be included in the chat. All attendee videos are automatically turned off and microphones are muted. Throughout the presentation and discussion, we invite you to please ask questions. Use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and we'll select questions um, at the end with our moderator. If you have any technical questions, you can also put them in the Q&A function um, and we'll answer them as best we can. Lastly, in the coming days after the series, a recording of this event will be posted on the Highline's website for future viewing. Thank you again for joining us. Um, and although we are in virtual space together, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that I come to you today from Brooklyn, New York, on the ancestral land of the Lenape and Canarsi. If you are interested in learning the name of the indigenous people whose land you live on, please visit the link in the chat. And I would now like to introduce our event moderator, Albert Foxconn. Albert, as I said, is the executive director of the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, as well as its founder. He is also a fellow at Yale Law School's Information Society Project, NYU Law School's Engelberg Center on Innovation Law and Policy, and the Day One Project. Um, welcome, Albert, um, and thank you, as always, um, for co-organizing and for moderating today's event. Melanie, thank you so much. Thank you to the Highline team for just making this incredible series a possible. I, I'm particularly excited for today's session where we're going to be hearing so, from some of the leaders uh, in you know, AI governance, thinking about how AI is being used in our world. And uh, so I want to introduce our, our panel. Uh, first, we have uh, Dr. Chris Gilliard, a writer, professor, and speaker. His scholarship concentrates on digital privacy, surveillance, and the intersections of race, class, and technology. He's an advocate for critical equity-focused approaches to tech in education. And as you'll see when uh, Chris enables his video, he is also a true believer in privacy protective uh, technology. And that's why he will be appearing only uh, in audio form. Mi Onu Oha is a Nigerian American artist creating work about a world made to fit the form of data by foregrounding absence and removal. Her multimedia practice uses print code installation and video to make sense of the power dynamics that result in disenfranchised communities, different relationships to systems that are digital, cultural, historical, and ecological. Lastly, Meredith Whitaker is the Mindaroo Research Professor at NYU and the uh, the faculty director and co-founder of the AI Now Institute. Her work focuses on the social implications of artificial intelligence and the tech industry responsible for it with a particular emphasis on power and the political economy driving commercialization of computational technology. So today we're gonna to begin with uh, a couple of presentations, first from Meredith and then from Mimi, and then we're going to go into a broader conversation, but really we wanna be hearing from you throughout this discussion because everyone comes to this topic with a different level of understanding of both the technology, the resulting social harms and the context in which it operates in our societies. And we wanna make sure that we're addressing the, the, the issues that you see as most important in this space. Also on a technical note, I want to mention that unfortunately, 
uh, our closed captioning system is not operating during this live session, that we will be ensuring that there is captioning available for the recording after uh, words. And we do apologize uh, for that uh, difficulty. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn uh, things over to Meredith for her presentation. Thank you, Albert. Um, I want to thank the Highline events team, Melanie and Costanza, for all the work they put into making this happen. And I want to say it is an honor to be here with Chris and Mimi, who are two of my favorite thinkers and people I learned so much from. Uh, I also, of course, want to thank Albert and the brilliant SOP team for inviting me. They do so much incredible work on issues of surveillance, tech, and justice in New York City. And so anyone watching who's not acquainted with them, I want to urge you to become acquainted with them and know that you, you have an advocate in your backyard if you're a New York City resident. Um, and then I also want to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the unceded Lenin Lenape territory, which is also referred to as Brooklyn. So, I'm going to give a very brief talk slash presentation that I hope helps illuminate the nexus of dangers that AI and the people with the power and status to develop and deploy AI pose to efforts for justice, equity, and a livable human future. So in this, I'll be focusing specifically on neuroenhancement technologies, which are dependent on AI resources and are also an example of the kinds of issues of social control and concentrated power raised by AI in general, along with the companies that develop it. Um, so with that, let's get started. So this is, again, a snapshot of research and analysis that I've engaged on and off for the past four years, which thread my interest in the political economy driving AI and the ways that AI functions to enforce normative categories of acceptable and unacceptable, worthy and unworthy. In this, I'm especially grateful to scholars from the field of disability studies, with particular thanks to Mara Mills, Sarah Hendren, Cynthia Bennett, Meryl Alper, Joy Rankin, Alice Wong, Faye Ginsburg, Chauncey Fleet, and many others whose work theorizes AI and computational technologies at the intersection of disability, asking fundamental questions about the politics and consequences of classification. So as a lens onto these questions, I'm going to examine the relationship between neuroscience, human enhancement, and AI, looking at the companies driving these technologies and the often wildly unsubstantiated claims that they're making. My hope is that this narrow focus will help a highlight AI's profoundly and inescapably normative functions and the power relationships that are guiding its application as a tool for social control. But first, I want to I want to ask and answer uh, in part how does AI relate to neuroscience and human enhancement to begin with. So first, there's a historical link between neuroscience and AI, in which well-funded scientists, generally funded by the U.S. military, in the mid 20th century, sought the key to consciousness in computational frameworks. Now the vestiges of this pursuit are still here in the slippery term artificial intelligence, and in the persistence if an evidenced faith that someday, somehow, AI will become sentient. Indeed, this near religious conviction has propelled some tech oligarchs to pursue computational human enhancement tech in the hope of yoking humans to sentient AI before this sentient AI leaves us behind. Now, second, AI and neuroscience are linked because AI techniques and the infrastructures required for AI comprise the foundation on which modern neuroscience and many other so-called human enhancement technologies increasingly depend. AI provides the tools for making sense of massive amounts of neural data. It's used to find correlative patterns in this data and to interpret them. And in doing so, it necessarily produces models of the normal human from our physical ability to our propensity for illness to our mental state. Now, a couple of years ago, I was struck during a conversation with a well-known neuroscientist. We were talking about data collection and measurements, and he mentioned an EEG measurement helmet used for collecting neurodata. Now, this helmet was designed for people with large heads and doesn't work on some smaller headed people, which means that it works better overall for men than for women. Now, since this helmet costs $200,000, his lab only has one. And by relying on one for data collection, his lab also subtly but meaningfully centers men as the norm, an unsurprising and persistent example of a familiar pattern. 
which also raises a serious and familiar question. Who gets to decide what's normal? It is impossible not to see the high stakes here and impossible to ignore the immense damage that oppressive classifications of normalcy have done to those who fall outside. As my co-authors and I stated in our 2019 Disability Bias and AI report, quote, the concept of normal, as well as the tools and techniques for enforcing normalcy, have historically constructed the disabled body and mind as deviant and problematic. So we need to ask what standards of normal and ability are produced and enforced by specific AI systems, and what are the costs of being understood as an outlier? And how might these systems contribute to enforcing and creating fixed categories that further marginalize those who don't fit or those who do? Now, in grappling with these questions, we must also recognize that AI's normative logic is impossible to escape. As Yuta Travaranias, director of the Inclusive Design Research Center at OCAD University put it, quote, when we process data to guide our decisions using standard data analysis, our decisions will be determined by the middle, which is the norm and represents the majority. In other words, adding more data to an AI system does not address the issue. It simply reinforces the normative model at the core of a given system's calculations, meaning that those who fall outside of this norm become increasingly remote outliers, and no amount of additional data can solve this problem. So with that, let's turn to the AI of today. As many of you are likely aware, AI is not new. The research field is over 60 years old. But in the last decade, it's newly everywhere. So a question that's always worth centering is why are we hearing so much about it now? Or what changed in tech to make newly, AI newly relevant recently? Now in answering this, we hit against the concentrated power of the tech industry and its singular role in narrating the story we tell about these technologies. Indeed, the technological breakthroughs that propelled the current AI gold rush from deep face to AlphaGo to GPT-3 are all contingent on the vast power and resources of the current big tech business ecosystem. It's no accident that all of these came out of corporate environments linked to big tech companies. They could not exist without this. It's also no coincidence that the recent AI boom began around the same time that we saw a mon the monopolistic consolidation of the tech industries in the early 2010s. Indeed, the AI techniques that these companies are relying on are, in many cases, very old. The algorithms themselves are very old. But until recently, the infrastructures to commercialize them did not exist. So that means there are only six or so companies in the Western context with the means to create AI at scale. These are companies that have three things simultaneously. First, they have vast computational power, proprietary chips, and supercomputing clusters that are effectively unavailable to those outside. Second, they can afford to pay MBA salaries to scarce and highly trained technical experts who develop machine learning models. And third, they have massive, massive, massive amounts of data, the kind and quantity of data that is almost impossible to get without vast and pervasive market reach. And where they don't have data, they can pay to create it and label it. So this may seem surprising, given that there are many AI startups in university AI programs. Surely they also create AI? Well, kind of. But if you scratch the surface, those startups and universities are almost all licensing infrastructure from Amazon, Microsoft, and Google in that order, and maybe IBM. And they're scrambling for data, which is extremely hard to come by in the quantities needed without a surveillance business model already scaled and in place. This is one of the reasons that elite computer science departments have become increasingly closer to big tech, relying on these companies for the funding and infrastructure needed to produce so-called state-of-the-art AI research. So now let's turn to neuroenhancement tech and uh, its relationship to AI. So given this, we should not be surprised that those looking to shake up the neurotech industry and bring neuroenhancements to market are some of the very same data hungry companies that already have the power and resources to make AI. Indeed, these companies are among the few positioned to store, process, and interpret the necessary data, and importantly, to commercialize and monetize such technologies. We're looking at Facebook, Microsoft, and Elon Musk's Neuralink. In 2017, Facebook boasted that it had a team of 60 engineers working to build a brain computer interface that promises to let you type with your mind. They put it this way, quote, 
We want to create a digital assistant that can literally listen to your thoughts anywhere and at any time and privately. Now, privately, you might ask? Of course, by privately, Facebook means without you having to say anything out loud, not without you giving Facebook the ability to store, interpret, and act on your neural data. Big difference, right? Um, the company is particularly enthusiastic about this technology in the context of augmented reality and virtual reality. And in summer 2019, Facebook updated the public on this effort, boasting that University of California, San Francisco scientists sponsored by Facebook through this initiative, quote, set a new benchmark for decoding speech directly from brain activity. Uh, in other words, the researchers used an AI model to correlate neurodata with speech, testing it on experimental subjects whose brain data they collected and interpreted using this model. If the subject confirmed that indeed the model got it right, then the model's efficacy at mind reading was confirmed. Now, Microsoft is also in the mix, or at least thinking about it. In 2018, the company published a patent titled Changing an Application State Using Neurological Data. You wear some kind of fancy headband, and presto, you can use your brain to close a browser tab. It's the same premise. And of course, there's Elon Musk's Neuralink, a company developing brain implants meant to be embedded in the skull, which dangle electrodes directly onto the brain. One more step toward his dream of avoiding human or Elon obsolescence by connecting humans to computers. Indeed, he cites as a key motivation, he cites this as a key motivation, driven by a fear that humans' limited capacity will be no match for AI supremacy. In explaining the necessity of brain computer interfaces, he says, quote, on a species level, it's important to figure out how we coexist with advanced AI, achieving some AI symbi symbiosis. And indeed, Neuralink promises to, quote, promises, quote, direct lag-free interactions between our brains and external devices. Now Musk, ever the showman, has already implanted some version of the device in a couple of pigs and a monkey. Commenting on Clubhouse earlier this year, quote, one of the things we're trying to figure out is whether we could have monkeys playing mind pong with each other. That would be pretty cool. But it goes beyond that. In a promotional video posted December 2020, Musk claims that Neuralink will solve a host of what he calls problems. Quote, the reality is that almost everyone over time will develop brain or spine problems. In the background, a video, in the background of the video, we see an image with the words memory loss, hearing loss, blindness, paralysis, depression, anxiety, addiction, insomnia, brain damage. He continues boasting that quote, an implantable device can actually solve these problems. Here, Musk presents a vision of humanity in which disabled people are erased, fixed by being turned into a normative version of a non-disabled person. In an inversion of the famous disability, this is an inversion of the famous disability rights slogan and is quite literally everything about us without us. Now, as disability activist and scholar L.A. Clare puts it in relation to deafness in this case, quote, many deaf people claim themselves not as disabled, but as a linguistic minority. They locate the trouble they experience not in their inability to hear, but in the non-deaf world's unwillingness to learn and use sign language. So in other words, the deaf community doesn't use universally welcome technologies that, quote, bring with them the non-deaf world's hope of eradicating both deafness as a medical condition and being deaf as an identity. Not everyone wants to be Elon's version of normal. Now, while the hype produced by these companies and their spokesmen is not grounded in scientific evidence and often borders on the absurd, absurd it, does not, it does expose a troubling worldview that paints humans as the problem and corporate tech as the solution. Neuralink president Max Hodak builds on Musk's AI human symbiosis fantasy, posting, po positing Neuralink as one weird trick that would transform people into some superhuman species. In a recent Twitter poll, he asks, asked in relation to Neuralink's potential capabilities, quote, do you, what do you think would have the largest impact on you? Eidetic or photographic memory, ideal attentional control, ideal emotional control, or control over the rate of time? Here we see a familiar framing gone one step further, the medical model of disability, which as scholars Sarah Hendren and Mara Mills point out, quote, views disability as an impairment, illness or disorder lodged within the individual. This model is now applied to the sum total of our sordid imperfect humanity with Hodak positioning our mortality as a problem to be solved. Indeed, in this familiar neoliberal frame, 
social issues are painted as individual failings and responsibilities. It is we who are broken and in need of fixing. Pay no attention to the systems that demand perfect attention, brutal emotional regulation, or memory recall incapable of forgetting trauma and distress. And it is Neuralink, Facebook, and other large firms that are offering to commodify this fix, and in doing so, to create the benchmarks against which our humanity would be measured. So now let's turn to the political economy of the tech industry once again. Because commercializing something like Neuralink doesn't just happen. It requires a lot of centralized infrastructure. And indeed, if you dig a bit, a bit deeper, you'll see, that the neural, you'll see that the Neuralink job ads are looking for infrastructure folks able to build, quote, end-to-end -end development storage and compute pipeline, able to scale to petabytes of data and hundreds of developers across multiple clouds. Translation? Your neurodata, measured via the embedded brain chip connected to an app on your phone, for real, that's how it works, will be sent to Neuralink server infrastructure, where this data will be stored, interpreted, processed, and almost certainly used to train and calibrate the next generation of brain models, which Neuralink relies on to interpret your thoughts, abilities, and physical well-being in the first place. And if current law and practice applies, this data and the models it trains will also be owned by Neuralink, who may or may not be willing to fight a national security letter requesting your thought logs who may or may not be willing to sell this data to insurance industry, prospective employers, or to sundry other paying customers. Now we can zoom out from neurotech to see this pattern in the role of industrial AI products throughout our lives more generally. AI or computational technologies marketed as AI and automated decision systems are, are being used to determine who gets access to resources and opportunities across an endless and now familiar list of core domains from education to criminal justice, to, health, to the healthcare industry, to real estate and rentals, to worker surveillance and assessment, and on and on. And again and again, we see these technologies replicating, amplifying, and entrenching familiar racialized genders and ableist patterns of inequity under the guise of computational sophistication. Now, importantly, the ways in which these technologies entrench inequality goes beyond the sad litany of AI systems and their predictable biases that fail to hear higher pitched voices, fail to see darker skinned people, and that otherwise reproduce historical patterns of racist, sexist, and ableist discrimination in their te technical functionality. This also means that fixing these biases, assuming it were possible, would not make AI a tool for good. We need to look at the power structures and profit incentives that dictate which systems are developed, how they're used, and by whom. Whatever the marketing claims, these systems are being produced by companies whose primary incentives are profit and growth, and they're being licensed to businesses and institutions to facilitate means testing, surveillance, austerity, and other forms of social control. The users of these systems are not the people profiled and assessed by them, nor are the objective functions baked baked into these systems calibrated to serve these subject populations needs. So we need to situate Neuralink and its ilk within this landscape and to seriously consider the risks of a future in which a handful of private companies have a claim, whether real or not, to a map of our lives, of ourselves, and of how we respond and feel at any given moment, where these companies, driven by capitalist incentives, could be positioned to interpret our thoughts, psyches, and bodies with more authority than us. We have only to go back to the 1960s to look at the political abuse of psychiatry, when, as Jonathan Metzl has documented, changes to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM, led to an, the increased diagnosis of Black civil rights leaders as schizophrenic, based largely on pathologizing Black men's activism. Or a time before 1973, when the DSM included homosexuality among its listed mental disorders. Or before late 2012, when it included being trans. Now, I want to be extremely clear. I do not see any evidence that such brain reading technologies are possible or that such claims would be valid. I would look to the work of Luke Stark and others who have documented the fundamental limitations of the current crop of AI systems that claim to read people's emotions, character, and capabilities for more on this. However, these technologies do not have to work as adver advertised to work as intended. And in reading the hype, we get a picture of the future these companies are aiming to create. So what do we do? First, we need to acknowledge that it's generally more profitable to shore up the status quo and serve the interests of those with power and money than it is to dismantle these structures in the name of equity and a livable future. History shows that those with power rarely relinquish it without pres pressure. And what's frightening about AI isn't terminators and super intelligent machines, 
It's the way AI works to centralize knowledge and power in the hands of those who already have it and further disempower those who don't. So to remedy the harms that AI enables and to reject its narrow and harmful models of normal, we need to confront this power. And researchers, organized communities, and organized tech workers have a major role to play here, contesting dominant narratives and demanding insight and control over these systems. Indeed, throughout history, it's clear that social movements and organized workers in particular have a key role to play in shaping structural, structural change in service of justice. Um, so my, my, hope for bringing, my hope for building a future that can contest the power vested in the AI industry and counter its shallow, shiny narrative sees organized workers, communities, and engaged researchers working together not, to not only take control of these technical infrastructures, but to architect their transformation, building in their place systems of care, justice, and well being. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Meredith, for the chilling introduction to both the, the AI that we're facing today, the AI we fear for tomorrow, and the surveillance that's making it all making it all possible. Um, so next, we're going to be hearing from Mimi, uh, who will have a, a presentation on the intersection of this field and, and artistic work and how, how those two spaces overlap. And, and then we'll be uh, going into our, our broader conversation. So Mimi, I did invite you to turn on your video uh, and, and really excited to hear that perspective on this work as well. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you, Chris. Thank you to Highline team. Thank you to everybody who's also here. Listen, we know it's hard to be on Zoom. So just, I don't take it for granted, all of you taking the time to be here today. Thank you very much. So my name is Mimi Noha. I am an artist. Um, I am going to, I'm going to talk through a little bit of work that I have made. Um, I'm going to do that by going through my website, which I think will be fun because artist websites are famously difficult. Um, and so I think anything you can do to sort of break them open and uh, walk through them can be really, really useful. Um, I am going to be talking mostly about older work, just to be a little bit more in line uh, with a lot of the themes of this of today's session. And I do have some newer work and maybe I will I'll speak to some of that later on, maybe in the Q&A, you'll come up a little bit later. Uh, and finally, though, I wanna introduce myself also by saying I'm an artist. I am perhaps not like the typical idea of what many people think of as an artist. Um, my work is not always the same in terms of output. I work across a lot of different mediums. So sometimes I have print, sometimes I'm making film, sometimes I'm working through video moving image, sometimes I'm working on installation, all different forms. And the thing that really ties my work together is a conceptual question. And that conceptual question is what does it mean to make the world into data? I think Meredith did such a great job of talking about the huge role that the creation and collection of data plays in AI systems and lots of other data-driven systems or automated decision-making systems that continue to impact our world greatly. And a lot of my work starts at this point of seeing that that is a process, having all of that data, it's an act, it's a process, it's an intentional one, it's something that has to be created. And a lot of my work is then stopping to think about why, why is that the case? What is it that goes into that process? And why, what have we inherited that tells us that we need to have that? Um, how, how are different groups interrupting some of those processes? How are groups, particularly those that are outside of so many of the uh, dominant systems, negotiating their relationship with this? And then crucially also, what is to be done <laughs> if this is true? If it is true that so much of the world is increasingly being made to fit these forms of data, then what do we do with that? And who, who is the we in that case? So these are a lot of the questions that I um, am interested in and that I'm tackling in my work. I am gonna be quick. I'm gonna go through just a few things uh, so that we have time to have a good discussion. Let me share my screen. There we go. Cool. Okay, so I wanna start with a, a much older piece. I think I'll go kind of chronologically uh, through some stuff. I'm gonna start with this piece, which is called The Library of Missing Datasets. 
let me get this in the middle. And as it says, uh, this is a project about things that have been excluded, uh, things that are omitted in a society where so much is, uh, is collected, so much data is collected. Uh, this project has a lot of different forms. It has uh, one part of it that is really more of a research output. There's another part that is a little bit more of working with various groups. And then there's this art part, and that's the part I'm gonna talk about today. And that's what you're looking at. It is this um, uh, simple seeming filing cabinet. And so where this uh, project started on, this is back in 2016, where this started from was from this realization that I had, I think this was while I was um, in residence or a fellow at the at Data and Society Research Institute. Um, and I sort of had this real, just had this sort of, had this realization, I suppose, that there were these spaces where loads and loads of data were being collected. But at the same time, there would always be these kind of gaps, things that were not collected in those same spaces. Um, and what really started me down this path was actually at this time, it was thinking about civilians who were being killed by the police, uh, particularly black folks, but in general, just the fact that there was no data around that, despite the fact that this is, there's so much data around policing, around incarceration and um, around justice. And yet at this time, when I was beginning on this project, there was nothing, it was a missing data set. Um, and so I started thinking, well, why is this a missing data set? And then I started keeping, uh, keeping notes on all of these different uh, missing data sets. And that's how this piece came about. Uh, what this is, is it's a filing cabinet. It's filled with all of these folders. Each of them has the title of a missing data set. The best way that I like to show this piece is uh, so that people can actually touch it and lift them up. Because when you pull out each folder, you'll see that there's nothing inside of it you know, because it's missing data. And it can be really wonderful watching people have that kind of tactile understanding of that. Sometimes it is shown in places where that isn't the case. Um, and in those cases, people can't touch it, but they can still sort of look through it. And the thing that I always am very, very uh, clear, what I, I work really hard to do is that wherever this is shown, the actual missing data sets that are within it change all the time. Uh, and they change so that they're related to the particular area that's being shown in. And so when it's shown in New York, which also, as plenty of people have acknowledged, um, lots of Lenape and Canarsie territory, this, whenever it's shown here, then I try to take data sets that have to do with this particular area, but this has been shown in a lot of different parts of the world, and each time I change it, um, depending on that. So what happens, I really, what I really like about this piece is that what it, it kind of takes this reality, which is that there are these gaps, not everything can be collected, and it really, it highlights those, but it also, what I like more than that is to take a step back and to remind people that this is really less about what data are missing than it is about what are these patterns of absence that animate the fact that not everything can be collected. And so to that point, I have written some things about this, which you can find, they're also on the website, about where I've written about what it is, what are the reasons why there are missing data sets? And usually I say that there are about four reasons. One of them is that sometimes there's this differential uh, in power between who has the incentives to collect something and then who has the resources to collect something. Uh, a really good example of that is the, the thing that started me down this path in the first place, which was about, as I said, um, data related to civilian skill based police. And there, that is a data set that could very, very easily exist if the police collected it. They are the ones who actually helped create this data set. They very easily could, but they have no incentive to. And so I should say today, this isn't a missing data set. It is, it is around, but it has taken a considerable effort on the part of so many different organizers, uh, journalists, community members, uh, just various, various people working very hard to try to collect this. And it has taken so, so much, so much time, so many resources, um, much more than would have been if those people who actually did have that easy way to do it had done that. So that's one reason, that difference between incentives and resources. But another reason why sometimes uh, there isn't, why there isn't always, uh, why something might be missing is that the act of collecting data can be a huge burden. You know, it is very easy to think that data is just this thing that exists, but sometimes, you know, often every data set has to be collected, it has to be created, and that is a process, as I've said. And so one example of something where there's a huge burden is data around sexual assault. Loads of people are punished for coming forth and talking about these things that happen to them. There's not as much of an incentive for many people to, to report this data or to even collect it. And in those situations, when the burden of reporting some kind of data can be really difficult, then it makes it so that, that you might have this missing space. Another reason why sometimes uh, data will be missing is that some things are just, they just resist metrification. 
This is like a technicality that is not uh, trivial. It's very big. There's have another series of work that has to do with places that don't show up on digital maps in places like Google Maps or OpenStreetMap, if you're familiar with that. And these are places that because of the way in which um, in which geographical data is collected, they don't, they don't show up in these places. We can see them through raster data, through satellite imagery, through photos, aerial imagery. But if we're just going through digital data, it, some of these places will not show up. And that's because they are resistant to the systems of collection that we have and have inherited. That's important to keep in mind because then anything you know, anything that comes further down the line that relies upon those systems, anybody in those spots is cut off from them. And then this kind of final pattern of absence, the final reason why sometimes, you know, we won't have data is that it can be very useful to not collect data. It can be a very useful act part, you know, and I say this whenever some kind of, um, you know, it's, it's always useful to someone to collect um, something or to not collect something, but Sometimes it can be useful to people who are situationally disadvantaged, people who don't have power in a situation to actually not collect something. And there are loads and loads of examples of this. I've, as I said, I've worked with groups on this. I've talked to loads of people. Um, one example that I can give has to do with uh, data collected around like sanctuary cities, around um, municipal ID cards in sanctuary cities in particular. So municipal ID cards are these cards that are you know, in various places, San Francisco, New York, New Haven, et cetera, um, places where people have these ID cards and they are really, they provide lots of access to things in the city, but they also are meant to provide some kind of form of identification for folks who might be undocumented. And there are some cities have had different approaches to that. There are some cities who in order to give you one of those cards, they will collect lots of information from you and then keep that. And then there are other, other cities who will collect that information just to give you the card and then immediately, they won't save anything. They immediately get rid of it. And when they do that, what they're doing is they're intentionally trying to protect people knowing that there could be a case where that information could be called upon. Um, and in fact, that has happened. We've seen political examples of that happen even in New York. So that's this project, this library of missing data sets. Uh, as I said, I think really the most important thing here is that it's not the things, the data that are missing, the act, the response is not always to fill this. You know, it's not just like, oh, this is missing. Let's try and fill this. This has happened to me. Loads of people have come to me and been like, give us all your missing data and we will answer it. And that is not the point at all. Really, the question is to think about what is the use of this? Why is it that these things are missing and who, who benefits in different ways? So that's this project. As I said, this was in 2016, um, this library of missing data sets and showed it in lots of places. And I wanna jump, I'm going to jump to um, another project that's in the same series, which is called, very simply, the Library of Missing Datasets version 2.0. As I made this two years later, and the thing that I, I want to highlight about this is that, in a lot of my work, something I like to do is return to a topic and make it differently, redo it. And so I have lots of projects that have different versions, like version 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and there are really, really two reasons for that. One of those reasons is that. I we do a lot of work that has to do with um, that talks about emerging technology, and I do like this thing that happens in software where you can release, you know, version just constantly release versions. There's this this just implicit understanding that this thing is always being worked on, um, and art in this context that I am here in this Western context has a very uh, a sense of finality to it. There's this emphasis on the artifact. And I also come from a culture. I'm Igbo. I'm from Nigeria, and a lot of Igbo people traditionally I have this idea of art being something that is constantly changing and the world being something that's constantly changing. And so within that idea, there are no museums <laughs> because that would suggest that there is one way, one final, one final thing. But in fact, there are many evil people who traditionally have believed that no, there's always a new way of doing things and we constantly need to be searching for that. And so I like to speak to that. So I like to create lots of different work in series. And so this is the second version in the library of missing data sets. So it's another filing cabinet. You can see it looks very similar. The difference is that this one is gold and the difference is also the actual data sets that are within it. And in this piece, what I'm trying, what I wanted to speak to was specifically data sets that have to do with blackness. And what I was interested in was this kind of dynamic, this dynamic that I had observed where there was lots of data sets about black people and about harm happening to black people, but those weren't necessarily owned by black people. And so I started thinking about this as a form of extraction in a way. And so that's where this one came from. It's shown in very different places. All of the data sets within it have to do with blackness across a variety of different contexts. Um, and so it's taking the same idea of missing data, 
but diving into a completely different part of it. All right, so let's move on. Ooh, we don't have much time. Um, I'll do a quick one. This is a different piece. This is called Us Aggregated. Us Aggregated. Uh, in the center there is an image of my mom. She looks amazing, that's her. Uh, but then she is surrounded by this frame cluster of all of these other um, women who have been tagged as similar to her. And so uh, these are, women who have been tagged as similar to her by Google's reverse image search algorithms, which in case any of you haven't used them, allow you to upload an image and see where that where else that image has appeared on the web. But in cases like this, this photo from my own family's collection, this photo of my mom, uh, there are cases where photos haven't been online, then instead what is uploaded are photos that are similar. And those uh, photos are just, the way that those photos are decided that they're similar is through a variety of different algorithms, one of which is this image recognition algorithm, which looks at what's um, identifies what's in the, the image, and then also some other kind of algorithms that mess around with the pixels of the image to try to see what's similar. And what I just was very interested in uh, with this project was a, a couple of different things. One was just this kind of soft touch to the world that was um, that was kind of being exerted here, I thought by Google's algorithms, that people didn't really realize you, you put this photo in and then something gets uh, given back to you and tells you that you're similar to this group, but actually none of these women have ever met each other. They form this group online that doesn't exist, but does exist because now they have been grouped. And I became interested in that as a kind of soft power, as a soft touch. When a lot, in a lot of these spaces, a lot of conversation around these, uh, these sorts of algorithms and the things that they do, they focus very deeply on a harm. And that makes sense, you know, and we should, and that is extremely important work. And at the same time, I'm also very interested in these, these, these like subtle soft touches that still affect the world, but are not seen as quite as important. And so they pass without anybody really thinking about that. This system was one, I was writing lots of code and constantly uploading images to it and seeing what was returned. And in doing that, I was able to reverse engineer, kind of monitor how Google systems work and enter in this strange relationship with those, where I could see how this was tagged one day as a photo of people standing. And then the next day, all of these photos were tagged as girl. I, you know, we, there is a diff again, differentials in power. Those of us who make up users, we don't get to see the decisions that are made behind these systems that govern our experience of the web, but they still do. And in this piece, what I wanted to play with was that, that the strangeness of that, of that being power, but then also the strange intimacy of this particular group of people uh, who are all grouped, again, grouped together. I really love this idea of doing a piece that actually required quite a lot of coding and programming to put together, but then in the end just has this, again, I has this kind of uh, seemingly simple just frame cluster presentation. I really like mixing those two things together of working with the technical, but prevent, presenting it in a way that feels very grounded. And um, yeah, and there's a couple, once again, I don't have time to go into it, but there are a couple different versions of this piece. This is the one that focuses on the frame cluster. Uh, there's a different version that is much that is a video and shows a lot of different images from my own family's collection. And that one talks a little bit about the algorithm. It focuses a little bit more on the algorithm itself and some of the dumbness within it, the ways in which it identifies things poorly, but then kind of encodes that and what that results in. Um, let's see, this is another piece, which honestly, I don't even have the time to go into as much, but you'll start to see a lot of, my, this is called The Future Is Here. Um, this is a piece that has to do with the people who do the tagging of data sets for supervised machine learning system. Um, these are people who actually, you know, in all of these, when people talk about AI machine learning, we talked about how this relies on data, but in order to get a system to try to recognize something or classify something, often you have to give it data that has been tagged in a particular way that it can read. And the question of where that happens is extremely important. Uh, this piece, show, it's a video piece. Uh, it shows the places where that happens, which is in uh, parts mostly in the global south and places like, I don't know if you can see in these photos, these are like somebody's bedroom, somebody's house. These are from Venezuela. I know I was, cause I was on a lot of these sites doing that same tagging of this data and um, communicating with the people who were doing it and got photos from them, which I then stylized in different ways and made into a video. And in this piece, there's so much more to say about this. But again, what I'm interested in is taking these things that seem very solid and just kind of stuck and really unpacking them to reveal all that goes into it. And in this part of what we see is the same, same labor relationship, the way that actually this, this is a technology that is presented as completely, this is, I'm talking about machine learning, it's presented as 
just completely future facing. There's this constant thing about, oh, wow, these computers are going to become sentient. But actually what, what forms the foundation for this is loads of people getting paid small amounts to do this very tedious tagging work and annotating work. And it is interesting that that huge mass of workers are removed from that, from the, uh, the vision, from the story, the narrative of what this technology is about. And that's really what this piece focuses on. I wish I had more time to show you more. I'm going to skip this one and just focus on the final thing. Um, this is kind of a different thing. This is called A People's Guide to AI. This was released in 2018. And this I worked on with my dear, dear collaborator, Diana Nussera, who's also known as Mother Cyborg. Uh, and this is a beginner's guide to understanding um, artificial intelligence. It is this very comprehensive guide. We take this approach called popular education. We tried to make this very friendly. I hope you can see by the graphics. There's, we did like lots of, we thought very warm kind of graphics, but in it, we talk really, we don't really um, skip talking about any of the, the basis of a lot of these systems. In fact, if you are interested in this, if you just search people's guide to AI, you can download this for free. And in it, we include so many things, including a glossary of terms so that you can understand what is the difference between AI and machine learning, but also included in that glossary of terms are things like, um, uh, what, am I, what am I trying to say? Things are just terms that have to do with the social structures that affect this as well. So it's not just that we talk about what is a computer. We also talk about what is structural racism and how does this fit into these systems? And that is, uh, and then we, we have all these different, I'll come back here. You can see we have a lot of workbook exercises. We're just very interested in supporting the different ways that people want to think and learn about this. We also describe what is an algorithm. This is an artist driven approach by two of us. We both have worked in various settings, a lot of community settings, also in universities, uh, also libraries all over the place. And so we wanted to bring that, that that knowledge, but a lot of this really came from the two of us sitting in spaces where we were being asked to think a lot about the effects of AI and we're really seeing, wow, where are the other people who should, who are actually very much uh, affected by these things? Why are they not here? And so we decided that part of our work would, could be to demystify some of these things in a way that was grounded and made sense and also connected to the social structures that are just so important to understand if we want to understand these same technical systems as well. Okay. I could talk forever. I'm going to stop it there because we've already used up a lot of time. And I want to make sure Chris gets a chance to talk too. Well, thank you so much, Mimi. I could listen to you talk about this work forever. It's incredible. It's um, And I, I just am struck by the intersection with what Meredith was talking about and sort of the gap between what data, you know, communities value and what is considered valuable by the companies that collect it, what the difference between those who operate and build these systems, those who control it and those who are impacted by it. And really there's just so many uh, overlaps. I, I'd invite Meredith now and Chris to, to turn on their video so we can go into the conversation portion. And once again, just wanna uh, invite the audience to submit your questions using the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of the screen. But Chris, uh, turning to you first, you know, we've heard about so many different themes within uh, the space and just so many horror stories and abuses and I, I just wanted to take a step back and, and just ground the audience in a, you know, how you think about what AI is at its core, because, you know, we call it artificial, we call it intelligent, but it doesn't really seem to be either of those things. Oh, well, oh. <laughs> that is a tough question. Um, but I mean, first, again, thank you to everyone. Um, and thank you, Meredith. Thank you, Mimi. Um, kind of blown away and still processing everything that everyone said. Um, but I, I do wanna draw on one of the things that Mimi pointed out, which is the extent, um, and Jathan Sadowski talks about this a little bit. He calls it Potemkin AI, right? The extent to which so much of what is, um, uh, we think of as AI, you know, is um, the result of uh, like microtasking, right? Like it's done by human hands, right? Um, in ways that a lot of people don't understand. And that um, so much of this, and, and to build on what Meredith said also, um, the hype about AI is actually more important than whether or not it does the thing that it does. Um, and, you know, Meredith and I have riffed on this before, the extent to which uh, the language that's used to describe these things that often don't work um, and 
you know, in some cases aren't even possible. Um, but the language that's used to discuss these things um, is very uh, carefully crafted in order to uh, make it such that people who are not considered experts aren't able to comment on it. Um, and so when we talk about what AI and what ML are, um, in some ways, they're just kind of placeholders for a system of beliefs um, and a, a way of talking and thinking, you know, that verges on religion in some cases about technology, um, but that very much exists to exclude and occlude what, um, how people are able to talk and think about it. And I, I know that some of our audience members are new to this conversation in this space. So I just wanted to let you know that ML is machine learning. It's a type of computing that oftentimes is classified as AI, though, as with every description in this space, it can be debated whether or not it, it qualifies. Um, and, and, you know, I think that, um, you know, thinking about, you know, the way we conceptualize AI systems one thing that often strikes me is that the algorithm, the software, it gets decoupled from the data that you know uh, Chris was talking about, that Mimi was talking about, the data that's collected uh, and tagged, and really the mass surveillance that enables that sort of system to be get, to be um, to be constructed in the first place. So I, I'd love to hear a bit about how you know what is the the full body of an AI system when you're thinking about it, not beyond uh, the algorithm itself. Um, and, and happy to go with uh, either Mimi or, or Meredith to start. Uh, yeah, Meredith. Jump in and I think, you know, I don't think there are clear boundaries here, um, but, you know, focusing on data, I think Mimi just, Put this so beautifully and you know i think you know maybe your work like makes this visceral in a way that i don't think a description can but you know, data is created right data is an answer to a question somebody's question somewhere right like what do i want to know about this how do i enumerate it in a certain way and my you know my my background before i started getting suspicious about machine learning and ai was building measurement systems so large-scale measurement systems which is effectively constructing data right and choosing certain methodologies certain environments certain parameters that we believed would be enough to substantiate the claim that this data was a a a, a um like the the right proxy for a certain thing right so we were creating data that we then said this data means this about that Right. And it was, you know, it's extremely messy and it's an extremely political process too. Um, particularly, you know, you know, it, it's, it's sort of constructing pro proxies for reality that then you can, you know, claim to mean this or that. Right. And I think, you know, I, I like the, you know, I like Mimi's sort of framing of it. The data is created. It's not gathered, right. It's not a natural off gas from our, you know, dynamic lives and our interactions with each other, it is gathered by people who have a question, by people who have the means to construct it, and, you know, by kind of interested parties with the resource to do so. And then it is sort of used for one purpose or another. So a lot of what we think of as sort of, you know, personal data is not, you know, it has nothing to do with Meredith and my life, right? It has to do with like, what questions did a corporation ask about me and my environment and where this thing was? I'm waving a cell phone for those of you who um, aren't watching. Um, and, you know, like, how are those questions, you know, how are those answers in the form of data then used, you know, to kind of you know, backstop the claims that are made by tech companies. So I think, you know, there is always this sort of messy human ecology and the political economy behind it informing, you know, data you know, to begin with, right? And then this data is piped into a system and there's, you know, different algorithms. LSTM is very common in um, like natural language processing. And again, the algorithm, you know, LSTM as a technique is old, right? You know, convolutional neural nets and you know certain techniques around that. That's sort of very big in a machine vision. That's also old, like the 80s, maybe before. I, I need to bring up my you know timeline, right? But like you're looking at techniques that themselves are old, but these data creation practices and the infrastructure to do them and the commercialization of these network technologies that give this sort of surveillance market reach are pretty new, right? So they then you know pipe these data into that and they build a model of reality based on what's in the data. Right. And then they're given new data and 
based on the old data and that model of reality, they say like, this data looks like a this, or this data is you know kind of similar to that. And then there's sort of a probabilistic determination that's made um, based on that. And they sell those determinations as intelligence. They sell those determinations as sort of computational sophistication, as efficient as et cetera, et cetera. And that's, you know, that's the story of AI, this sort of general purpose intelligence that's always backstopped by these sort of like messy data realities that, you know, of course replicate, you know, these, these sort of um, erasures and harm of racial capitalism, these sort of legacies of exclusion and marginalization, hyper surveillance and erasure sort of coexisting together. And there's no real way around that without, you know, actually attacking those systems at their root. It's not a technical problem. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, social structural issue. So, okay, sorry, I, I went on for a long time, but I wanted, I wanted to give the capacious answer, and then maybe we can uh, dive into some of the. More no, no, th I think this is so important, especially for people who haven't thought about the interconnectivity here between all of these different aspects of computing and business and data collection, and you know, I, I think. One thing this makes me think of is, you know, when we're looking at these sorts of, you know, AI systems and we build up, you know, this sort of public, you know, perception of it as objective, as it's, as something that is smarter than us, something that, you know, I can't watch TV without seeing some ad about how AI will solve all of our problems and we just need some company to swoop it. Why do you think that we portray AI in these utopian terms? Is it simply marketing or does it speak to something deeper in the way we we, we view technical systems? And, and maybe we can start with you uh, first, Mimi. Yeah, well, you know, I that's a big question. I am not gonna pretend like I have the, the like end all be all answer to that. I do just love what Chris said when he said AI and machine learning are placeholders for a system of beliefs. I think that that does really, it just gets right at the core, that there is something in this narrative. The narrative does more work than the actual things. Like over and over, you really see this. The narr the story, there's something very compelling in this story. It fulfills, I think, a story that was begun hundreds of years ago. It, there's something that I think people find very, um, just very grounding in this idea that there's this like deterministic answer to everything. And if we just have the right tools, we can, we can get at it. We can like unpack it. We can just chisel it away. And that as in many cases, again, that narrative does a lot. That's what, I think that's what we see when you look at the labor for this and you're like, oh, these are the same labor system, the same system of relations that have existed for hundreds of years. Wow, all of it is exactly the same. Uh, it's interesting, I think, looking at these systems and thinking about what is new and what parts are old. And the problem, of course, is that to do that, there is so much language that is trying to, that obscures it and that, how, you know, advances this idea of like, this is only for certain people who know how to do this, who know how to understand it and make it so that it doesn't feel like it's available for many other people. And I think that is, you know, that's the thing that so many of us are pushing up against and trying to demystify and trying to just unpack because it is extremely important. I want to go, I want to actually go back to the previous question too. I think it's, you know, all these things are connected, but I also was just really vibing with what Meredith was saying and I want to just like plus one it um, and also add that thinking about like the system and the data and the algorithms, that's something that you see often, um, sometimes every now and again, a company or organization, whatever, will release the algorithms that they use to make sense of whatever thing. They so rarely will release the data. <laughs> It's all, it, it's just, you never see it. You never see it. Nobody even talks about it. And so I think this thing, you know, thinking, I always think about data as just what people want to collect and what they can collect. And that like keeping that incentive there, that, and that ability, those two things yoke together. And also I think that bringing up this idea, another thing that really is useful for me and grounding a lot of these conversations is thinking about this data collection as a relationship, as a Thing that where there there is a group that wants to collect something and then there are groups that make up the collected and then there are these things that mediate that relationship but that is a relationship and then if you think of that as a relationship i think it gets at a lot of these other questions and the issues that come up where it's like okay well then why why do you know why are why are people uncomfortable with something oh, okay well who has ownership of it how long you know who was told about it who gets to decide the terms upon which it's collected who knows about it et cetera et cetera that is again another long, um, unwieldy answer, but I hope, I hope it, I hope it connects to this. 
oh no, completely. And I, I think that gets to one of my, my favorite lines of discourse in this whole area, which is, well, how do we respond, right? You have these systems that are incredibly, you know, pernicious and invasive and becoming more and more a part of our life. And how do you actually respond when the power structures that enable them are so unequal and so mm -hmm. distorted? And I, I'm just thinking, you know, specifically to your point, Mimi, when we see a growing movement to open up the algorithms behind these systems, and when we know that's not enough on its own in the absence of the data set and all the other uh, parts of, of these AI systems. So what do we, how do we respond? Do we, do we, do we outlaw it? Do we, do we regulate it? Do we, is there, is there a way of, of having AI that doesn't perpetuate these same sorts of inequities at its core? Um, and happy to start that with anyone. I, I realize I am just asking you to solve one of the most intractable problems in modern society. Chris, I'm happy to start with you. <laughs> I mean, I, well, there's so much, so many ideas floating around. I mean, I want to speak a little bit really briefly to um, your previous question. And, you know, I think a lot of the people who have their hands in this technology um, very much view themselves as kind of world builders um, in, I think, some very dangerous ways. Um, and I think one of the most um, attractive things is the idea that they're going to build something that's even better than themselves, right? They're going to build something that improves upon humanity. Um, and that's where we get a lot of the stuff about, like, super intelligent AI and things like that. And you notice that the people who are worried about things like that are not, you know, so like, we don't need super intelligent AI to dominate us because like um, the really mundane AI that's deciding whether or not you get a job and whether or not you get an apartment and, you know, whether or not you get like, uh, you know, assistance, like is already kind of crushing people in like everyday ways. So the people who like were are worried about super intelligent AI, which I think is like a bizarre fantasy are not the people who are kind of being um, disrupted by it every day. Um, but to respond in response to the second question, uh, I think, you know, and I, you and I have talked about this a lot, right? I think one of the things like we absolutely need to be willing to do is to, to say that some of these things should not exist, right? Like there are some ways, um, some of these systems I don't think can ever exist in, in equitable ways. And we need to foreground that and forefront that um, when we talk about this, right? Instead of uh, often nibbling at the edges and trying to make things that are terrible slightly less terrible. I, so many amazing points there. And I, I feel like we could have a whole separate conversation of whether the people at the risk of sounding sacrilegious are the people building these systems trying to build a new god or be gods themselves in creating this new uh, secular uh, mode of, of, of sort of worship and in, in finding this thing that will answer all of life's questions. I kind of uh, think it's both. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that makes sense. Uh, anyone else who would like to talk a bit more about the how we respond, what the, the solutions are, uh, you know, and maybe not one solution to every aspect uh, of this dilemma, but you know, different um, things that can give people hope that we're not just on this uh, inescapable path to some technological dystopian future. I guess I can weigh in a bit and just sort of speak more personally. I think, you know, I think for me, a turning point that moved my theory of change from sort of you know, coming up with better analyses, projecting those analyses, sort of, you know, fighting a battle of ideas to a area of change that focused much more on kind of organizing and building power. You know, that was, if that happened while I was working in tech, right? And that happened while I was in a role where I was literally paid to come up with ideas and sort of like, you know, promulgate like good sounding solutions. And then I was just like watching them fall on the floor and be used as sort of like, you know, mar marketing accoutrement or sort of like brought up to 
prove the point that you know Google, where I worked, was actually like extremely woke and you know listening to the critics, right? Um, and I think you know like again, this is sort of where my where my analysis of the consolidated power and the sort of corporate centrality of AI comes from. Like I don't I don't see a history where we sort of beat back you know institutions with this much power by convincing them to give it up, right? Like, and I think you know you look at the the facial recognition bans that have, you know, begun to take root in a number of places across the country with like Portland being the most substantial. And that, you know, that was not an argument that was sort of like had across the board, boardroom, right? That was organized communities and a number of folks who had enough knowledge of these systems to provide, you know, analyses of their harms. You have journalists doing FOIA reports, et cetera. But that was a, you know, that was a pitched fight where people just began to demand what they wanted instead of sort of like arguing around the perimeters of these technologies or saying like de-bias them for it, right? And I think, you know, I think we, we need to recognize these narratives as narratives of power in which sort of technological domination is somehow reframed as intelligence. And we need to recognize that, you know, this is not technology within the world we live in today that is going to serve us just for like basic material reasons, right? It costs so much, much, much money forever and ever to deploy software at scale, right? Like you just have to have developers that are always updating your version as, as like, as Mimi was saying, you're like constantly reversioning your software for every single platform, every time the platform <laughs> reversions itself, right? Every time there's an API change on any of these infrastructure providers, you have to have a team of people who are responding to that. And that's just sort of, you know, software development labor costs. Then you have to, you know, you have to have marketing, you have to acquire the data, you have to license very expensive infrastructure and no one runs their own servers anymore. So again, like I said this in the, in the short talk, it's Amazon, Microsoft, and Google are sort of the AI development environments. And they're also the sort of AI development tooling environment. So you're like, you're using sort of tools and processes that are made and arbitrarily changed by these companies to create these technologies. And then you're getting data from somewhere. But again, you can't get data in the quantities that are needed for these sort of, you know, deep learning, you know, the kind of like supervised machine learning, which is what we talk about when we're talking about AI a lot of times at least in the abstract, like you can't get the data you need in those quantities without the business models that are already scaled in very, very expensive ways, um, which have like, you know, they're sort of entrenched monopolies, right? Like you can't bootstrap all of that at once. So, you know, the conclusion being that we're not gonna just like, you know, hand roll the people's AI. And if you did, then we need to like, look at the points that Mimi has made. And that I know Chris has also made, like there is a power relationship encoded in the construction of data, right? Especially the construction of data at scale, which is sort of what's called into being for these systems. And that there's, there's the data creator, the people who decide which proxies are, you know, the right proxies to describe reality. And then there are the subject populations about whom those proxies are constructed. And so I think we need to actually look at that and be like, you know, in what cases are we creating data about ourselves, you know, in a way that's consensual and collaborative, you know, and I think about, you know, Ida B. Wells' red letter, right? When, you know, like she was working with communities to create data that was existential to survival and to put things on the map. Or I think about the anti-eviction mapping project that works with communities to create data about evictions and the effect of tech on evictions that is like very collaborative, but is very distinct from these, the scaled processes of extraction that are inherent in the current AI economy. So that's I, I, my long answer. <laughs> No, no, no. And I, I think that gets to a point that was raised by one of our audience members, which is consent and just the the how part of the power structure that is driving AI as we see it is the non-consensual, you know, taking of our data and the violence that is, you know, inherent in that process. And I'd love to hear a bit more on how each of you views the, the lack of meaningful consent for how the data in our lives is turned into a part of these systems that then are governing our, our lives. Can I, can I go back a second though? Sure, sure. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, again, just wanted to riff on what Marin said. Um, you know, uh, I think it takes um, broad-based coalitions of workers, um, communities you are affected, scholars, activists, journalists, um, the example of facial recognition, right? Five, six, seven years ago, 
when you said like you know like this probably shouldn't exist and people would give you some genie out of the bottle kind of thing and and say that um you know despite this history saying otherwise right that once the technology has been released um that there's nothing we can do about it and so we've seen that 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 is not true um we've seen in the last two or three years a lot of what um some people call like kind of fuck the algorithm moments right where people realize the way these um black box systems are affecting their lives and, and sort of become um, much more well versed in pushing back against them even i look at like atlantic towers where they wanted to install facial recognition or did install facial recognition in some apartment complexes in the way that um, those communities push back um and so i think it one of the things that requires um is a, is like yeah broad-based coalitions but of people led by uh, you know communities who are the most affected could not agree more. And I, I think when it comes to that question of the genie being out of the bottle, I think history proves that argument is false. You know, we had leaded gasoline as the norm in our country for decades before we outlawed it. We had coal fire power plants in almost every city and we uh, we outlawed them. We we have outlawed technology so many times when they see when we see that they are you know injuring our communities and cutting people's lives short and, and you know sadly you know that is the 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 stakes we see with a lot of these ai systems um and, and just um on that cons but but to circle back to that that consent piece and the question of how you know people what role consent plays in in uh ai systems when it comes to data collection especially when so much of it is driven by the illusion of consent, you know, the terms and conditions style consent that people click through but never actually agree uh, agree to, never actually read. I'm kind of gonna talk about that, but I also am circling back to the previous question because I think it's just, I think it's so important and I think it does play into this. Thinking about consent, there's this do you or do you not? And it's like this closed, a closed system. And really I think, this previous question of what do we, how do you respond in general is a way to think about that, but also think expansively. And I just wanted to point out this, that there's like kind of two, I think there are two sides to this. What do we do in the here and now and what do we do for the future? And I think as you know, Meredith and Chris have already brought up such great examples of things where it's like some, some stuff just gotta get closed down. Some stuff needs to be canceled. We just gotta be done with it, that's it. And then other things do need to be better regulated. Other things, we have to recognize the narratives of power that are at the center of them, you know, and really try to think about what what animates that, what come, what puts, like what has created that and why has that persisted. But then there are many spaces where I think these just local organizing, I say local, it can be, that can be like your neighborhood, but also your workplace or whatever that, whatever that community is, because I think community is a broad term, it can mean a lot of different things. It can be your family, it can be so many things. But that kind of hyper local, local organizing with an eye to what exactly is affecting you. But then also having a sense of this, that the thing we're talking about is a global thing. There's a global political economy that organizes a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. And seeing the kind of solidarity between stuff that's happening with certain groups here and then groups in other parts of the world, I think that's very powerful as well. And that could be because I have that you know, I, as someone who is from multiple different places in the world, that's the perspective and the seat that I kind of occupy. But more and more I see, okay, there are things we can learn from each other, but we also have to know who the we is in any particular moment, any kind of organizing moment. And then the other thing I wanted to say that I think is just also so, so crucial is that we keep, you know, we kind of keep saying this, but there, there are these small ideas that are wrapped into every single form of technology. They are just like at the core and they're so small, they can be very hard to see or very hard to sense. And I think that another hard thing that has to be done is that we have to come up with different ways of doing things and different ideas to supplant those. So that once we're like, okay, we don't want this here. There's something where we're like, well, this is the kind of world we wanna see. This is what it looks like for technology to serve X group of people. And it's okay if we're sacrificing profit because maybe, because maybe that hasn't served us so well in the past or et cetera, whatever it is. And I think doing a, a doing that work 
which is very hard because it's like that work of imagination and it is it is denigrated and seen as deeply unimportant and very trivial but actually is incredibly incredibly important that work of saying okay well how could things be different not just how could it how do we respond to the thing that we're seeing but how do we envision something totally completely different that is such one of i think the most difficult things but it's so crucial because we can't we can't build a world we can't see we can't build a world we can't imagine and so that that is so indispensable i know we're coming up on time but i wanted to ask each of you just to share um one you know example of how you see ai being portrayed you know in in you know the public consciousness whether it's in art or in uh in fiction or in political uh debates that makes you hopeful that people are starting to understand the harms and the limitations or or just something that you are grateful is out there educating the public uh and, and sort of breaking down some of these uh tropes um so i ha happy to start with anyone for uh for that Um, Meredith, maybe we can uh, start with you. Sure. And I'm, you know, I'm sort of circling for a sort of discrete example, but, you know, I can say between, say, 2016 and now, there has, I just feel like there's sort of like this, this mycological web of like skepticism and kind of um, toward, you know, AI claims that has been you know, has been, you know, frankly, I think kind of uh, like, like, you know, helped along by you know, folks on this call and others who began, you know, began reframing questions around AI and began pushing back on some of the more extreme claims that are, you know, that are being made about these, these systems. And I, you know, you, you now have, you know, there was a, as Chris um, alluded to, there were, you know, whole protests in the UK around sort of a broken algorithm um, that was sort of guesstimating students placement in extraordinarily racist and you know like really basic racism um and you know there were like signs they were holding fuck the algorithm right and i think that you know i think a, you know this is my kind of assessment but i think a couple of years ago that connection between like okay this was a system that was created by people that was all you know like that was put in place and this is like the you know this is the cause of this problem i'm experiencing and i'm seeing kind of communities and and others like quickly make that leap and then you know mobilize in ways that you know that that there was a lawsuit around that algorithm and the results were walked back right so i see you know i see there just being a lot more you know people breaking through what i think about is like the politics of intellectual shame around like not being a computer scientist or not being a machine learning engineer so like can't touch that and being like i don't care if i'm the person constructing these i'm the expert on the harm they're doing to me or the expert on you know the harm that say the police force always does when it gets new toys and we don't want it right and there's like a you know there's a boldness and there is like a clarity of vision that seems to be emerging more and more that gives me hope and i think you know i also really love seeing this sort of the movements and these sort of like you know i, I won't say disciplines because that's sort of academic siloing but like there's a lot of connections being made between like climate movements and you know folks doing kind of bordering and sort of nationalism and you know like doing a lot of different things and recognizing like okay we're seeing the same logics and the same text threaded through these things how do we you know how do we join forces and begin to recognize these as like you know as connected struggles and i think there's a way in which the expansiveness and the vagueness and the sort of general purposeness of this tech has on the flip side allowed a sort of you know connection like if it's used everywhere then we all are united in solidarity against these types of modes of oppression and, and technological social control so yeah that's my answer albert <laughs> no and, and i really appreciate that i think we've heard from everyone today just the importance of the organizing we see on the ground not just here in new york not just here in the united states but around the world and and really that local organizing unfolding you know in parallel in so many thousands of different communities against the same systems it really it, it's part of what makes me hopeful that we're not going to the dystopian future uh, of uh, so many science fiction novels 
I, well, I, I feel like uh, we could continue this conversation for hours, but sadly our, our time is at an end. But I really want to thank all three of you for, for joining us today, for, for your incredible perspectives on all of this, and, and just for the amazing work you've been doing to, to help you know, redefine what AI means for so many people and bring us closer to the day where it's no longer doing harm uh, to our communities. So, so thank, thank you all for that. And with that, I'd like to hand things back to Melanie. I'm actually going to jump in here with my one audience question. Mimi, if I could pull you for a last second, you can talk just briefly about your um, people's guide to AI as we're ending on resources to be grateful that are out in the world. Um, and maybe we can drop a link in the chat. Yeah. Um, I mean, I kind of said everything about it before, but it is just this um, this zine guide publication. You can buy it for five dollars on if you want a hand copy, but it's free. The digital version is online, and as I said, it really provides, I would say, kind of beginner's comprehensive overview of algorithms, machine learning, AI, deep learning, all of those terms. Really teases out exactly what they are, but then talks about applications and talks about just what it looks like to be thinking about how these systems intersect with all of everything that Meredith was talking about, the many connections between these systems and all of the other social systems that they are built on top of. And that is um, done by myself and Mother Cyborg slash Diana Nussera, a wonderful collaborator. And it's part of a like, uh, soon to be forthcoming suite of materials that we like to release that are meant to do this work of, I just love who, who said it? Was it you Meredith who talked about that politics of intellectual shaming? Just kind of refuting that and being like, nope, nope. Anybody who's affected by these systems has a right to speak on how it should be, how they should be deployed or how they shouldn't be. And that is the whole point. That's the whole point of the guide. Um, I don't know if I have a link, but it's very easy to find online. <laughs> Amazing. We just dropped it in the chat. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, Albert, Chris, Mimi, Meredith, for this amazing conversation. Um, and I have to shout out all of our colleagues behind the scenes who've made this possible. Constanza, Jamie, Nadia, Harish, Carly, Misha, Janelle, Tichelia, Mauricio, and many more, um, as well as our advisors who've been advising on the speaker series throughout, um, and all of the public engagement around Sam Durant's project, the Center for Constitutional Rights, Immigrant Defense Project, Media Justice, Mihense, Empower Chain, Reprieve, and of course, the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project. Um, thank you to the members of the Plinth Committee who have made the entire Plinth program in this series possible, and of course, to everyone here who's attended our event today. Um, to learn more about these topics, um, you can join us for our next event on September 16th at 6 p.m. Eastern. We will be hosting the third event in our series on art, artists, and conflict, um, featuring the amazing Sam Durant, as well as Coco Fuspo and Naima Hamian, which I will have the honor of moderating. Uh, to learn more about the upcoming events in the series throughout the fall, you can sign up for our newsletter, visit the Highland Art website, um, which you can find linked in the chat. Um, we will have the chat up for a few more minutes uh, before we close the webinar, if you want to go through those links. Um, thank you again for attending to all of our amazing panelists, and we will see you next time.